Okay, welcome back everybody. So before the start of next lecture, let me make a very, very short announcement. As you have seen in the program, there are some computational hands-on planned, both in Python scientific computing and in Mathematica. Regarding Mathematica, in case you don't have Mathematica installed, you should have got a free license that allows you to use Mathematica for the, for the weeks that cover essentially the, the school. In case you have not got an email with your permission to use Mathematica by tonight, please come to me tomorrow and then we have to set it up. Uh, instead, for the Python lecture, just bring your laptop and we will usually, we will most probably use uh, application through server, so make sure that you have a terminal installed, but that should be more than enough. Okay, with that, I'm the pleasure, I have the pleasure to introduce our next lecture, Deeper Duck, that will tell us about our sphere models. Thank you. Okay, so let me start by thanking the organizers for asking me to give you lectures here. So firstly, I'm not fully familiar with the background of the audience here. So I'm going to make some guess about what you know. And uh, you know, some of you will be more advanced than others, and so there will be always some mismatch of the level at which I'm going to present the lectures. But uh, you can interrupt me and say, or privately later, you can tell me that this is going too slow or too fast, and I'm happy to adjust the pace to your uh, comfort. Okay, so then, what I will discuss in these lectures is phase transitions in hardcore systems. So firstly, this is going to be mostly uh, dealing with classical statistical mechanics. And uh, of course, in the title of the school, it says quantum matter. So why am I discussing classical statistical mechanical models in a school on quantum matter? So I had discussed this with Professor Mosner earlier, and he said that you know, one should not take the title too seriously. And whatever you think is interesting or useful for people to know would be useful to discuss. So they, what I would like to discuss are things which I feel are very important for you people to know. Okay, whether it is classical or quantum, that is the first thing. The second is that for macroscopic systems, which is what we discuss, the quantum matter and classical matter are not actually so different. Uh, when you discuss very small objects, then the difference between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics is very substantial. When you discuss bigger things, like cars, of course, uh, you know, it, it's quite obvious that classical and quantum description should coincide. If you discuss something like superconductors, where things are, you know, there is this thing, we, superconductivity is said to be quintessential quantum phenomena. But then you can hook up some classical version of it by just introducing a quantity called phase, which of course has to be explained quantum mechanically. But then you think of phase as a classical um, dynamical variable, and then the rest of the superconductivity can be very well explained by theory, which just involves one phase, the phase of the wave function, whatever that thing is. Okay, so classical mechanics can be thought of as an effective Hamiltonian for whatever system you are going to discuss. Okay, and it is a very good effective Hamiltonian. Uh, the second point is that for hardcore models, you know, the kinds of hardcore models we discuss are things like dimers on a lattice, fully covered dimers or um, other shapes of stuff, 
hard spheres were mentioned of several times in the lectures before. So all these uh, are classical stuff, but they are mm, mm, quantum mechanical systems like RVB wave functions or something which are well described by these. Or the kinds of orderings one sees in systems of hard core particles are the kinds of orderings you will find also in quantum matter. Okay, so um, that is the explanation for these. Uh, there is, of course, another um, sort of um, justification, which is that suppose you want to discuss a d dimensional quantum mechanical system. It can always be, you know, we discuss quantum mechanical systems usually at zero temperature, and that is the most commonly studied problem. Then the corresponding problem can be set up in some path integral formulation where it becomes a d plus one dimensional classical mechanical problem. Okay, so you sum over histories, which is like sum over configurations. And so, whatever you learn in classical state mech can then be applied to some other problem in quantum state mech. Okay, um, so mm, firstly, provides good simple model for phase transitions classical or quantum Um, then I need to know some prerequisites which I will assume. So I will assume only the minimum which is that all of you are familiar have had the first course in statistical mechanics. You are familiar with uh, micro canonical, canonical grand canonical ensembles so and you know partition functions or um, ideal both ideal classical gas or um, Bose and Fermi non-interacting gases. Non-interacting. Uh, no more. Okay, so then we ask that why are these hardcore systems interesting? So my sort of answer to this question, of course, is that they show very rich variety of phenomena. You find interesting non-trivial behavior in these systems. And uh, since these are hardcore models, either configurations are allowed or not allowed. And so one can work uh, with these models without defining ever something called energy. And or something called temperature. So these are purely geometrical um, systems. And they show interesting behavior.
So they are models of what is called geometrical phase transitions. What are phase transitions here? You can have things called equilibrium phase transitions. So these are examples. Um, hard spheres, which have been discussed a lot. It turns out that if you take a big box and you put in, the only thing I say is that there are hard spheres in this box. Um, I assume everybody knows what is a hard sphere. These are just, uh, we imagine things like balls made of steel and they cannot interpenetrate each other. And if they are far away, they have no interaction. So this kind of a system, you just put n balls in a volume, or let us say right now they are all of equal size, and all configurations which are allowed have equal statistical weight. That notion we still will uh, take. And then I just ask what is the typical state of this system? You know, if I look at this, these may be molecules in a box. These kinds of models were studied by Boltzmann. Um, so it's very clear that at low densities of these objects, particles can move all over the place. And uh, you know, you have something like a gas, but it's not an ideal gas, it's a nearly ideal gas. If the density is very high, this goes into a state in which uh, particles become localized to some small regions. And each particle can move locally, but the whole system shows a crystalline order. This we will not prove, but that is experimentally observed. Okay? So just the fact that you have hardcore interactions can show a phase transition from a gas phase to a periodic solid phase. I think that's very remarkable. And you know, we would like to understand this, and we would like to understand similar properties of other systems. What can we understand about hard sphere system, you know, this, uh, yeah, if one studies phase transitions in the standard way, then, they, you know, there is this PT phase diagram, and there are two variables, uh, two independent control parameters, and it is hard to discuss. Here you have only one control parameter, which is the fractional volume occupied by the spheres. And so the problems are expected to be easier to understand. And to that degree, they are more useful to, as a starting point, okay? Um, so, the, this is a hard spheres uh, undergo a gas to solid transition, periodic solid. Mm, this is an equilibrium transition. But you can also have non-equilibrium transitions which is very simply de described like this. Suppose I take up some shape. This time I take a triangle and put two spheres inside it, okay? Now these spheres can move around so they can go all over the place wherever they can reach. But now I squeeze this the triangle a little bit, slowly. Eventually, you will go to a state in which the triangle is smaller, spheres are of the same size. But now one of the spheres stays in one part and the other stays in the other part and they cannot cross each other. This sphere cannot come here and this cannot come here because there is not enough space. This is intuitively obvious. Maybe I can take change the shape of the box, but you know, so initially the phase space available is fully connected. You can go from any configuration to any other allowed configuration by continuously moving the spheres. If you change the density, then you get to a stage where the phase space breaks up into two parts. One, of, one sphere is on this side, two is on this side, or the other way around, and these two cannot be exchanged, okay? So you have a ergodicity breaking phase transition 
it's a non-equilibrium transition. In the, when you study time-dependent property, you will find that, oh, this particle always stays on this side, this particle always stays on this side, like, and so on. Okay, so you can have non-equilibrium phase transitions. This one is called localization. Okay. Okay, so then so that was sort of the general preliminaries. This I can so in the lecture today I will I have a limited um, plan and what I would like to discuss are three things. One is what is called a Tonks gas, and the other thing is um, and the third thing is. Um, Okay, uh, so that's all that we want to do in the remaining um, one and a half hours. And uh, so I will go slowly. I mean, I'm not going to cover too much material in this time. Okay, so what's a Tonks gas? Tonks is, of course, a name of a scientist. Um, the gas was already introduced earlier. You have a one-dimensional line and you have hard spheres and they move on the line but they cannot cross each other and we want to calculate the equilibrium statistical mechanics of this system okay so this is sometimes represented like this but i prefer a picture like this one Okay, so because it's a one-dimensional system, the shape doesn't matter. All it says is that there is excluded interval in which the other particle cannot come, and then they can slide around. Is this picture clear? They, they are very simple notions, but I just want to ensure that everything is clear to everybody. I expected an answer, yes, and all of you are very quiet, so I think so I see that you are reluctant to speak out. But as I said, since I don't know your background, it will help me if you give a feedback about what I'm asking. I just want to ensure that these things are obvious and trivial and I don't have to explain further. Okay, very good. Okay, so Tong's guess. Um, this is the definition of the model. So this is the simplest interacting particle system that we can discuss, okay? And in this case, we are able to get the exact answer analytically simply. And I will do that calculation in front of you, so it's easy to follow. Um, so this is... Tonks. Let me write this usual Hamiltonian, which is summation pi squared plus 2m plus v ij 
xi minus xj summation over ij which are pairs. So, this is the kinetic energy, that is the potential energy. Um, this is very standard, but let me do it once. We want to calculate z is equal to integral dnp dnq. These are the momenta coordinates, these are the position coordinates and e to the power minus beta h. And so, here the momenta integrals separate from the configuration integrals and I can just do all the momenta integrals together because they are separate. You know, even if I had, right now I have only one dimension, so there is a p1, p2, p3, but if, even if I had a vector p1 x, p1 y, p1 z, they will all be separate integrals and it will be some number e to the power minus beta p squared by 2m dp integral minus infinity to plus infinity to the power n. Sorry? Bigger. Okay. Bigger than this. Okay. I thought I was writing very big. Okay, so because the momenta integral separate out, you can just put them away and this is called configurational integral, which is what we discuss. Hence on, the momenta will not be mentioned because they are all integrated out. We will only deal with this stuff, which is Qn, let's write down, Qn is actually, I think, uh, Werner wrote it integral dnq uh, e to the power minus beta v, which is the potential energy function, okay? And this was equal to integral dn. This is just change of notation. Uh, one. This function is one if allowed and equal to zero if disallowed. Okay, this is a function of xi. No problem so far. Okay, now we want to calculate qn for arbitrary n. Uh, I know that large number of you can do this, but let me do this still. Um, sometimes it is helpful. So I, I'm not sure how to do this integral. It's kind of hard. Let's see if I can do Q1. That's very easy. There is a line so here. There is a line of length L. There is a single particle which we do like this and it moves around. And I have, so the position is x1, and I have to integrate over the allowed values of x1, and the integral is 1 over the allowed values and 0 outside, and it is very clear. Ah, so I should, yeah, 1 minus, sorry for change in notation, sigma will be the diameter. So Vij is equal to 0 if xi minus xj is greater than sigma by 2 is equal to infinite if xi minus xj is less than sigma by 2. Okay? So in this thing, the lowest value of x1 allowed is sigma by 2. Left hand is sigma by 2, right hand is L minus sigma by 2. So the allowed range is L minus sigma, and that is my partition function. Q1 is L minus sigma. 
okay that was easy q2 it's a little bit more work now i have two particles so i have the same range l and there is one particle which comes from here to here the position is at x1 there is a second particle at x2 and i got to do the integral over the allowed range of integration so i will redraw this picture in the q x1 x2 plane so whenever x1 is less than sigma by 2 that is not allowed so this region is forbidden sigma by 2 whenever x2 actually yeah if this particle was here on this side even then it shouldn't be beyond l minus sigma by 2 so this region is also forbidden this is l minus sigma by 2 similarly for the x2 this value is forbidden this region is forbidden this is sigma by this is l this is l minus sigma by 2 this is sigma by 2 0 okay also whenever x1 minus x2 is very small that region is forbidden so x1 equal to x2 is this line this is not allowed in fact they are not allowed to come close to each other like this so this region is also forbidden and the rest is allowed okay so the problem is very easy you got to calculate this area and this area together and that's the allowed region and that is the integral okay so hmm so i got to determine the length of this side length of this side and the area of the triangle that is easily done because this length if you fix x1 to be at one place the value of x2 minimum is um, 3 sigma by 2 the best i can do is to put this particle here and then the next one here and this is at sigma by 2 and this is at 3 sigma by 2 so this coordinate is 3 sigma by 2 then you can figure out the area of the triangle it is not very hard so the answer is l minus 2 sigma whole squared the way to do this is to realize that i can actually work a little bit better if i define a variable called delta 1 and delta 2 which are the spacings between the this is spacing from the left end to the first um, particle and this is the spacing between the two particles there are two variables so i can write delta 1 delta 2 so there is a change of variables x1 equal to delta 1 plus sigma by 2 x2 is equal to delta 1 plus delta 2 plus 3 sigma by 2 oh yeah that is correct but i would like to write it as x um x2 minus x1 is equal to delta 2 plus sigma okay so obviously this is a linear change of variables dx1 dx2 is equal to d delta 1 d delta 2 jacobian of this transformation is 1 okay and then i will draw the same picture in the delta 1 delta 2 plane De sorry delta 1 here 
delta to here and it becomes simpler because the condition is delta 1 is bigger than equal to 0, delta 2 is bigger than equal to 0 and uh, delta 1 plus delta 2 is less than equal to L minus 2 sigma. Hmm. So, that did not work out very well. L minus 2 sigma, this is L minus 2 sigma, this is the allowed region, this is the forbidden region. Hmm. That was pretty good except that I missed out a factor of 2. This is the allowed region, no? Delta 1 plus delta 2 less than L plus 2 sigma. But that gives a triangle which will have some, uh, you know, it looks like this. So, what is going on? Some mistake was made, obviously, perhaps deliberately. Okay, so what I, what I did here, which I should have said or should, didn't say, before making this transformation here, let us impose x1 less than x2 less than L. I impose an ordering on the um, variables x1 less than x2. This is not necessary in the original problem in the phase space, x1 does not have to be less than x2. But in one dimension, I can do this. In two dimensions, it will not be very obvious how this can be done. Okay? So, if I make x1 less than x2, then I define delta 1. X, delta 1 is the distance of first particle from the left end minus sigma by 2. Okay? And then um, the partition function uh, evaluated here will be, um, I am just trying to make sure of my notation. This one is good right here. So, this partition function partition function with fixed ordering. It, this is too low for people, it is okay. I should work above, okay. Partition function for x1 less than x2 less than n equal to L minus 2 sigma squared by 2 factorial. Okay. That is not inconsistent with this other result which I wrote here. The difference is just a factor of 2 which comes because of the orderings. If you take another with x2 less than x1, that will be the same result. And when you add those two together, you get this full partition function q2. Okay, is that clear to everybody? Okay. Uh, so, without further ado, now I can do for n bigger. arbitrary n, n bigger than 2. So, you define delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, so on. Delta i is equal to x i plus 1 minus x i minus sigma. Again, the Jacobian d x i by d delta i is equal to 1. And so then the conditions on delta, hardcore conditions on delta i 
are simpler, they are each delta i is greater than 0 and summation delta i is less than L minus n sigma. Okay, and then this part is easy now. Delta i are bigger than 0 and sum over delta i is less than n sigma and the corresponding figure in three dimensions is some stuff like this. It is an n dimensional pyramid in n dimensions. And the partition function, the volume of this pyramid, if, if you have a pyramid of size L, L size, each side L, what is the volume of this? L cube by 6. I hope you remember. Now, that is that's one of those things one has to remember, you know, not. Okay, so it is. Um, it is here. So, q n is equal to L minus n sigma to the power n divided by n factorial with fixed ordering. So, that is the main result. It was rather straightforward. That was sort of um, end of our discussion, but one should get a feel for what this QN does. So, I will recall. This is from the st stuff you have read. If I know the partition function and its dependence on volume, and I change the volume, that is equivalent to pressure. So, given the formula for the partition function, I should be able to calculate the pressure of this gas as a function of the density. Okay? So, I write here pressure is equal to d log z divided by dv. Okay. So, in our case, it becomes n times d log L minus n sigma divided by d L. Okay. So, that is equal to n over L minus n sigma. So, this can be written as rho over 1 minus rho by rho star. Where rho star is equal to n sigma by L. Okay. So, rho star is a scaled density or rather rho, uh, rho is this is equal um, rho star is equal to sigma by L and rho by rho star will be the, um, so n um, sorry just one second n sigma by L is equal to rho by rho star that is the scaled density. Okay, it is proportional to n, n sigma by l, that was the problem. Okay. So, the pressure as a, uh, so P is equal to K B T rho divided by rho star over 1 minus rho by rho star. Uh, it is the Van der Waals form, you know, the, the pressure as a function of density initially grows linearly and then it diverges near rho equal to 1 and rho can never become bigger than 1, all very reasonable. Okay? But we could get this result directly from very elementary considerations. So, that is the Tong's gas. Yes, sir. Uh, v is equal to 
which were V. Oh, this is the volume of the gas. This is the sort of formula I expect you to remember. Whatever notation there is, is the one which is given in your textbook. When I interpret it in my problem, it becomes this one. Okay? In our case, the volume is just length. Okay? Any other question? Okay, very good. So that was easy. And then I can do the second one. I hope I will finish that one. If not, we can still continue in the next one, but I hope to finish in the next 15 minutes because it's an easy. Once we have set up this much machinery, then the rest becomes easier. So somebody will come and say that, oh, but this was rather trivial, you know, you had these hard spheres and there were no Inter, no other interaction, everything became known interacting in the new variables delta i. And then suppose you had extra interaction, then what? So, so Takahashi considered a slightly more complicated Vij was of this form. It had a hardcore part, but then let us say there is some attractive interaction. And then it is zero beyond some range. So he said that V of R is equal to inf infinity for R less than sigma is equal to minus F of R for R between sigma and 2 sigma and is equal to 0 for R bigger than 2 sigma. So this function here can be any shape. You can take this one or this one. It's just a function f of r. And for arbitrary f of r, we will try to get the exact solution to this problem. OK? Uh, OK. So what is the point of this? Suppose you have hard particles. This was our system. You have hard particles. So the closest the third particle can come to the first one is distance to sigma. It cannot come closer. Okay? And then by this condition, the interaction will be 0. So in this case, by construction, the gas becomes a nearest neighbor interacting gas. We did not assume this. We just chose a form of the potential. But for this form of the potential, the interaction only occurs between nearest neighbors. OK? So then I would like to again calculate Q. equal to integral d n x um, e to the power minus beta summation d x i plus 1 minus x i. Okay. And we have already learned, so we will use the same change variables to delta i, which are the spacings, OK? And then q is equal to integral d n delta e to the power minus beta summation v of delta plus sigma. OK. Um, 
um, sorry, this is from two. So what's going on? Well, I had this gas. So there was this first particle. But the first particle has this facing delta 1 from the left wall. But I don't know what's the interaction with the left wall. Maybe I should specify that it's a boundary condition. The, inter the, f and the interaction between the left wall and the part first particle has to be specified in addition. You can put some other function there. You should put some other function there. We are going to take the easy way out and we'll just put it to zero. It turns out that it doesn't, you can check or you can verify, convince yourself. It doesn't matter. The details of what is the interaction with the left wall does not matter if the system is big enough. The effect of walls will only matter to order one by volume. So we will, we will not worry about the thing and we'll just set it to zero. We'll not, we we'll say there's no interaction with the wall. Okay. Similarly, on the right side, the n minus 1th particle will have an interaction with the nth particle, no? But nth particle doesn't have any interaction with the n plus 1th particle. Okay. So this was delta n and there is no delta n plus 1, but so there is no term here, sorry, this is n, but there is no term corresponding to the spacing between the last particle and the right wall. That is by our construction, that is our definition of the model. If we change the definition, you can put that in, you can worry about it, I will not. Okay. So the statement is that the energy in our case, V simplifies to summation delta I, I is equal to 2 to N. Uh, F of delta I, mm, yeah, F of delta I plus sigma. Okay. And now it looks independent again. So it was not such a big deal. No? If in hindsight, what Takahashi did was actually rather obvious now, but only in hindsight. At that time when he did this problem, it was a highly non-trivial problem, one of the first interacting one-dimensional system, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and people didn't realize that in this, you can construct a potential Vij such that the problem can be actually solved exactly simply. Okay, so very good. So this is now, this is looks more tractable. So this is, now these integrals are more or less, so what are the conditions on these? Delta i is bigger than equal to zero. Summation delta i is less than equal to L minus n sigma. So all these integrals I could do if they were independent. But right now they are not independent because there is this funny condition that some of them has to be less than something. So they are all coupled. The delta i variables are not independent, they are coupled variables. Okay, it's obvious. Okay, so how do we make them, how do we solve this problem even when the variables are coupled? And so the answer is that, well, these variables are coupled, but only by this condition. So if I get rid of this condition, then the variables will be not coupled. So how do I get rid of this condition? So I don't know. I guess Takahashi was very wise to realize that the thing to do, so this is called QL, is the partition function for size L. He said, don't worry about QL. You take the Laplace transform of QL. Define Q tilde P. Define is equal to integral Q 
Qn of L e to the power minus P L. Usually there is a beta written, so let me write it it is L 0 to infinity. It is a Laplace transform of Qn of L. You would like to determine this function for all L and uh, right now I am not able to do it, but if I could, um, if I knew Q tilde of P, then I can take inverse Laplace transform of this function and determine Q of L. So, what we will do is we will first determine Q tilde of P and then uh, determine Q of L. So, Q tilde of P, okay, my time is nearly up is equal to integral d delta e to the power minus beta f delta i plus sigma summation over i minus p beta delta i mission over i. So, the p term here we wrote a Laplace transform, but what is this p? This p sort of says that I imagine an ensemble in which the l can be varied, but if l varies it occurs with the weight e to the power minus beta p l. This is called the constant pressure ensemble. The idea is not to define a new notation, but to make clear what is the assumption. If you work in a system in which the pressure is constant instead of the volume, then L will be variable, but different values of L will occur with different weights, you know, like if you go up, then you do work and this is the cost of that stuff and this is the partition function for this system. Okay? So, now if I do this, then L is no longer fixed. Each delta i can vary independently of the others. And so, in the constant pressure ensemble, all the delta i become independent variables. Okay? And so, this answer becomes equal to product over i integral d delta i e to the power minus beta f delta i plus sigma minus beta p delta i to the power n minus 1. I guess um, I should worry about what happened to delta 1. Delta 1 will also have an integral which I did not write down, but it is e to the power minus beta p delta 1. So, I know how to do that one. Perhaps there is also an integral related to the last spacing because you know now the piston wall is variable to move. Then I have to integrate over all possible positions of the right wall, but again that integral is easy to do. So, my time is up. So, uh, a few minutes. So, I cannot do all those integrals in gory detail here, but it is easy to see that they factorize. And except for the boundary terms which we discussed orally, the answer is just n fold multiplication of a simple one dimensional integral. So, you give me this function f, this is just one integral. I can do this integral, it becomes a function of p. So, let us call this g tilde of p to the power n and then there are some boundary condition dependent prefactors which I will not write down in full detail here. Okay? And so, then this partition function is done. Then, if you want to determine Q of L, you have to take an inverse Laplace transform. But you know, there are all these Maxwell relations and stuff. If you know the answer in constant pressure ensemble, then you can determine them in the other ensemble. D by dP. 
So that's my last comment. d by dp of log q tilde of p is equal to beta okay so that is the condition uh, if you give me l average then you can determine the corresponding value of p and vice versa. These are conjugate variables. If you think of p as a Lagrange parameter, then initially its value is not known. But using this condition, you know what is the best value of p. And that is the corresponding result. If you don't like this semi hand waving treatment, then you do the full Laplace transform. We didn't actually do the Laplace transform. We said instead of doing the Laplace transform, you just take the most likely value where the function uh, is maximum. And that gives us the most relevant answers. And so that is where I will leave this discussion about the Takahashi case. Okay, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Ah, so this function f, of course, the function should be well behaved for the limit for the well behavior to exist. I didn't specify in great detail the well behavior conditions on f, but the simplest condition is that f should be bounded from below. That is enough. It doesn't have to be bounded from above. If it's infinite in some range, it will just give zero integral. Not a problem. Okay, if the interaction energy becomes minus infinity for some spacing, that will be a problem. That will mean that energy per particle will be in minus infinity. That is not uh, what we want to discuss. Okay, so that's not a good model to study. Choosing an f in which it goes to minus infinity is not a good model to study. Okay. Okay, so we break for lunch.